Good evening and welcome to Woodruff Road. If you're a first time guest here, I just want to remind you that there are cards in front of you, blue cards. Just fill those out and hand it to one of us at the end of the service. But what a joy it is to be able to close out the Lord's Day um, on Father's Day. Our God is our Father and He has called us into His presence. And so some of the things that I want to remind you of tonight, uh, just what's going on in the life of the church, we have two announcements for ladies. So that does not include me. But ladies, summer study begins this Thursday at 7 p.m. And then ladies' fellowship dinner is also this Saturday. So if you you are interested in this, there is a sign-up sheet in the back at the booth. You can go ahead and get more details there. I think the book study is The Hole in Our Holiness by Kevin DeYoung. So if you're interested in that, go ahead and uh, sign up for that. And I would highly encourage you to go ahead and do that. Tonight we close out the Lord's Day. Every single one of us has been bought by the blood of our Savior. And the Lord tells uh, his people, Ezekiel, that he will dwell with his people. He says in Ezekiel 37 that I will establish and multiply them and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. The nations will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. And the Lord's aim and intention is to be among his people. What a privilege it is to be able to close out the Lord's day and know that you are with the people of God and the Lord calls you into his presence. So as we close out the Lord's Day, prepare your hearts. Be ready to meet with the Lord as we give our tithes and our offerings. Get ready to meet with the Lord together with his people. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 134, where the psalmist writes, Behold, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord, the Lord who made heaven and earth. Bless you from Zion. Join me in singing as we take our Psalter hymnals and stand We sing uh, hymn number 167, Jesus, Wherever Your People Meet.
As you remain standing, grab your bulletin as we confess from our confession of God's covenant with man, the covenant of grace. Christian, what do you believe? As you remain standing, please take your copy of God's Word as we turn for our New Testament reading to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 18. That's Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 18. Hear now God's Word. For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never, with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do your will, O God. Previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds, I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Now, where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. The grass withers and the flower fades. Man, you may be seated. Psalm 40, the psalmist writes for us, Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud. Later on, he says, Burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. 
I delight to do your will, O oh my God, and your law is within my heart. This is where the author of Hebrews gets this New Testament reading we just read from. Where we choose to spend our money reveals what the delight of our hearts are. When we willingly and joyfully worship the Lord, this reveals where our hearts are, and we do that with our tithes and our offerings. So as we give now, as we give, we teach our families, we teach those around us where the priorities of our hearts lie. So as we give, give to the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for these tithes and these offerings that you have given to us that we may give back to you. Lord, we pray that you would use these tithes and these offerings for the advancement of the gospel, the advancement of your kingdom in this world so that your glory would fill the world. We thank you. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks for your great love towards us. A love that cannot be measured, a love that goes well beyond our comprehension. We thank you for your great love that has chosen us in Christ before the foundations of the earth were laid. In Christ we have every spiritual blessing and in him we have all that we need. Because of your work of redemption, you have removed the rebellious heart of sin in us and put in a new heart of flesh with your law written on it. Father, we give thanks for the work of your spirit who both works in us and through us to conform us to the image of your son. We thank you that he reminds us of our need for our Savior and that there is no blood of bulls or goats that can fully atone for our sins. Holy Lord, who can ascend your hill? Who is able to stand before you? Who is able to go up to you for us? Your word teaches that it is only he who has clean hands and a pure heart. 
And for this reason, we thank you for our Savior who has purchased us with his own blood, a people from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. Even here in Woodruff Road, we thank you that we are yours. Lord, tonight as we close out the Lord's Day, we pray for our church. This evening, we have said in our hearts that we desire to come up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, where your law would go forth. And Lord, we desire to see our Savior face to face. Until that great day, we ask now that you would keep your church establishing her, strengthening her in the knowledge of Christ our Savior, who promised that he would build his church and that the gates of hell would not prevail against her. We pray that we would not chase after the broken cisterns of this world, but that we would drink deeply from your word, from the wells, the deep wells of living water. We pray for the ministry of the word tonight, that your word like a hammer would break and shatter the idols of our own hearts and that we would be strengthened by the balm of the gospel. We pray for our teaching elders and our ruling elders, that they would not faint nor grow weary in doing good, but that they would wait on you for their strength to be renewed, moment by moment, hour by hour. Lord, help us to love you with all of our heart and soul. We don't love you the way we should. We also ask that you would keep us as our our, our interns, that you would help us as we learn from our shepherds here, that we would learn in all humility how to lead God's people, your people, Lord, how to lead them in love and in zeal and in patient endurance. Lord, tonight many have struggled to get here. We ask for those who are struggling. We pray that you would Help them and remind them that you are their God and that we are your people. Perhaps there's trouble in the house. Perhaps there's trouble in the marriage. Perhaps there's trouble with children or even in their own bodies. Some of us have had family members that have passed away. And Lord, you see all of these things. Every thought that comes into our hearts, you see. And we pray that through all of these trials that we may, though be sorrowful, that we would always be rejoicing and that you would remind us that the testing of our faith produces patience. Your providence in our lives is no accident. And we know that every affliction that we face is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So, Father, help us to look even in the difficulty of our circumstances to the things which are eternal. Lord, we pray for our presbytery. We pray that we pray for our presbytery and the churches represented in Calvary Presbytery, that you would guard us from error and that any foothold Satan would take, you would guard us from those things. Humble every pastor in our presbytery in order that Christ would be exalted above every single name and false or erroneous teaching. Grant this presbytery humility and boldness, discernment, and resolve to preach the gospel unadulterated with the steel conviction of your word in their spines, so that your church, under the care of Calvary Presbytery, would be built as living stones coming to the chief cornerstone, our Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, Lord, we ask for our missionaries. We pray for them that they would be strengthened too, for Yegar and William Castro, Moritz and Bertie Cohen and Mike Cunio, all of these missionaries, Aaron Halbert, we pray for all of these men who are laboring in the fields that you have sent them off to. Lord, we ask for them that you would strengthen them, that they would not fail and that they would wait on you. Before you, Father, are the names of every single member of this congregation, all of the churches that we partner with, every single pastor in Calvary Presbytery. You know all of our names. And, Lord, these names are from every tribe and nation and language and tongue. And, Lord, we ask that you would continue to grow your church, that the gates of hell would not prevail, and that your name would be honored here in our lives, and that we would endeavor to pursue holiness. We thank you, Father, for your kindness. We thank you for your patience towards us. We thank you for your love that we see in Christ our Savior by the power and ministry of your Spirit. And we pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. Please take your copy of God's Word for our Old Testament reading.
And would you stand to honor the reading of his word from 1 Samuel chapter 6. 1 Samuel chapter 6, our Old Testament reading. Now the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, saying, What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us, how should we send it to its place? So they said, If you send away the ark of the God of Israel, do not send it empty, but by all means return it to him with a trespass offering. Then you will be healed, and it will be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. Then they said, What is the trespass offering which we shall return to him? They answered, five golden tumors and five golden rats, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines, for the same plague was on all of you and on your lords. Therefore you shall make images of your tumors and images of your rats that ravage the land, and you shall give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will lighten his hand from you, from your gods and from your lands. Why then do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? When he did mighty things among them, did they not let the people go, that they might depart? Now therefore make a new cart. Take two milk cows, which have never been yoked, and hitch the cows to the cart, and take their calves home, away from them. Let Then take the ark of the Lord, and set it on the cart, and put the articles of gold, which you are returning to him, as a trespass offering, in a chest by its side. Then send it away, and let it go, and watch." If it goes up the road to its own territory, to Beth Shemesh, then he has done us this great evil. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that struck us. It happened to us by chance. Then the men did so. They took two milk cows and hitched them to the cart and shut up their calves at home. And they set the ark of the Lord on the cart and the chest with the gold rats and the images of their tumors. Then the cows headed straight for the road to Beth Shemesh and went along the highway, lowing as they went, and did not turn aside to the right or hand or to the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them to the border of Beth Shemesh. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley, and they lifted their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. Then the cart came into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh and stood there. A large stone was there. So they split the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. The Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the chest that was with it, in which were the articles of gold, and put them on the large stone. Then the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and made sacrifices the same day to the Lord. So when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. These are the golden tumors which the Philistines returned as a trespass offering to the Lord. One for Ashdod, one for Gaza, one for Ashkelon, one for Gath, one for Ekron. And the golden rats, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines, belonging to the five lords, both fortified cities and country villages, even as far as the large stone of Abel on which they set the ark of the Lord, which stone remains to this day in the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh. Then he struck the the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. He struck 50,070 men of the people, and the people lamented because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. And the men of of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? And to whom shall it go up from us? To whom shall it go up from us? So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kirjath Jerim, saying, The Philistines have, come, have brought back the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up with you. This is the word of the Lord. As you remain standing, please grab your Trinity Psalter hymnal and turn to Psalm number 34C through all the changing scenes of life. Hymn number 34C.
The circumstances of the narrative we're about to hear are summed up in the first clause of chapter 6. I hope you have your Bible open and are looking at it. We're going to dig deep. This chapter is somewhat confusing. It contains several historical occurrences that you probably have never seen or will ever see. And so it's going to take a lot of explanation. So I hope you'll have your copy of God's Word open before you. But I want you to look at that first clause in chapter 6. The ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. These words summarize the great calamity that had occurred in the people of Israel in chapters 4 and 5 of 1 Samuel. If you'll remember, if you've been with us in chapter 4 and 5, the Philistines had routed the armies of Israel in successive battles, killing over 34,000 soldiers of Israel and taking the Ark of the Covenant, taking it back to Philistia. But the Philistines who thought, wow, we've got, we've got a magic potion here, we've got the Ark. As soon as they get the Ark back, things aren't going so smoothly for them. When they set up the Ark of the Covenant in the temple of Dagon, their primary idol deity, Dagon keeps falling down. Every morning when they go into the temple of Dagon, there he is, now bowed down in a position of worship before the ark. The next day, not only is he bowed down, but his hands and head are broken off, we found in 1 Samuel 5. And what we read is, is that everywhere they try to ship the ark, they, inside the five major cities of Philistia, they send the ark on a tour. No, we don't want it, you take it. No, we don't want it, send it over there. And so in Ashdod, in Gath, in Ekron, everywhere the ark goes, the same thing happens. The residents, for example, when we look at chapter 5, of every city where the ark goes are struck with tumors. And the Philistines start recognizing that this outbreak of tumors, wherever the ark goes, means that Jehovah's hand is heavy upon them. And we read in chapter 5, verse 12, that people are dying in these Philistine cities. And now, if all of that wasn't bad enough, look at verse 5 in our chapter. Chapter 6, verse 5. The Philistines point out that the rats are ravaging their land. This is like uh, one of the ten plagues that was foisted upon Egypt. So now the Philistines, just because they have taken the ark, they are under a triple curse. Think with me about where they stand. First of all, their gods have been reduced to just broken stone now. Their bodies are filled with tumors. Their field is overrun run with rats. And what we see is <clears throat> that the Lord is marching through Philistine cities as the ark goes through. He's marching through their cities, triumphing over them, degrading them. A few days earlier, the Philistines had been exulting over the capture of the ark and bringing it home. Now they can't get rid of it fast enough. They didn't know or didn't understand that the ark represented the covenant. That arrangement by which Jehovah was to be Israel's God and Israel to be his people. Israel knew God only because he had made himself known to them. Now the ark of Jehovah was in the country of the enemies of God and his people. And a vital aspect of the covenant was that Jehovah would deliver Israel from their enemies. In fact, the first words engraved. If they were to have opened the mercy seat and looked inside, the Philistines would have seen the first phrase that was engraved on those stone tablets before the Ten Commandments even begin. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And so even that preface to the Ten Commandments states, I'm for Israel, I'm against her persecutors and oppressors and enemies. Tonight we're going to begin to understand much more about Jehovah's ways with his people and his enemies. So I hope you have your Bible open. Let's pray together as we seek the Lord's help. Almighty God, in you are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Open our eyes now that we may see the wonders of your word. Give us grace that we may clearly understand and choose the way of wisdom through Jesus our Lord. Amen. I want you to look with me at the first section of chapter 6, that's verses 1 through 14. Even though Israel had experienced difficulties and setbacks in their history, never before had this happened. They've lost possession of the ark. 
Now, week after week stretches by and they have no ark. Then months after months, Israel is without the centerpiece of their worship. Any onlooker could say Israel has been forsaken by Jehovah. They still possessed the altars on the outside of the tabernacle. They had the priesthood, but not the centerpiece, not the jewel and the crown. The contents of the Holy of Holies have been taken. 1 Samuel 6 is the account of how those seven months come to an end and where that left Israel. Now, back in Philistia, look at verse 2. The leadership of the Philistines are desperately trying to rid themselves of the ark. And so I want you to notice the funny interplay between civil leaders and religious leaders. Look at verse 2. We read, The Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, saying, What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us how we should send it to its place. Well, you'll remember who the the diviners were. We would call them witches. Diviners were a class of people that Israel was forbidden to consult in Deuteronomy 18. It was a it was a death penalty offense for an Israelite to go to a diviner. They're mediums, they're witches. Now, listen to what the civil rulers of Philistia are asking these pseudo false religionists, these diviners. They say, uh, it's your job to study comparative religion. You're up on all the gods of the surrounding locales. And so tell us about the religion of the Israelites. Obviously, their God, Jehovah, is unhappy with us because we have his ark. So what would make him happy? The biblical author does something fascinating here. I want you to stare at verses 2 through 9. And what you have when you are looking at verses 2 through 9 is the conversation that happens between the civil leaders of Philistia and these diviners and the the false priests of Philistia. And it is, this is why I want you to take notice of it, it's the longest speech ever recorded by Philistines in secular literature and biblical literature. It's 120 words long in Hebrew from verses 2 through 9. And it gives you some fascinating insight into what the Philistines know and what they don't know, what they get right and what they get wrong. And so uh, roll up your sleeves, look at verses 2 through 9 with me. Let's see what these Philistine diviners know. Because they're getting ready to weigh in and they're going to tell their civil magistrate, here's what we need to do to get rid of the, the rats, the tumors, all of this headache that you have brought upon us by capturing it and bringing it back. So I want you to notice what they know. Now, when we ask, how do they know something? They either know something by general revelation or special revelation. So look at verse 5, for example. They know some theology. They say, therefore you shall make images of your tumors and images of your rats that ravage the land. You shall give glory to the God of Israel Perhaps he will lighten his hand from you, from your gods, and from your land. And so notice what they understand. These are Philistines talking. They know that Jehovah's hand is heavy. They confess omnipotence. Now stop and pull back for a moment with me. Do you know what every lost person who's ever lived knows about God? Not just Philistine diviners living 3,100 years ago. But even today, an atheist in Marseille, France, a tribesman in Papua New Guinea, they all know certain truths. And these diviners are quoting from general revelation. Let me prove to you what they know. Keep one finger here and look at Romans chapter 1. This is your pagan next door neighbor who says, I'm an atheist. I've never looked at a Bible. I'm not interested in religion. But he knows some things about God. Look at what Paul says in Romans 1. In fact, your lost neighbor, the tribesmen in Borneo or Papua New Guinea, they even know certain attributes of God. Look at Romans 1, 18. Paul says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. Now here comes the big bite for you to swallow. Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his, here it comes, 
his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. So what Paul tells us is everyone who's ever lived knows that there's a God. In fact, the man who says to you he's an atheist is not really an atheist. He's just a liar. Because Paul says in Romans 1, everybody knows they're a God. And they suppress that truth in unrighteousness. They work hard at it. It's their full-time vocation, suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. But they can't get away from these truths. And look at what kind of God they try to suppress, according to Romans 1.20. They know of his eternal power. And so here we are with these Philistine diviners. And the first thing they say to their civil magistrates is, this God we're dealing with, he has a lot of power. His hand is heavy. Where did they get that from? General revelation. They stopped suppressing the truth and unrighteousness for about five seconds and said, everybody can see that. Jehovah has power. They get it right. But notice the second thing they get right. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, they say, if you send away the ark of the God of Israel, do not send it empty, but by all means return it to him with a trespass offering. Now, they don't know this by general revelation. They know this by special revelation. Somehow or another, they have heard or they've gotten a hold of a copy of of the, the first few books of the Bible. What they're quoting there is Leviticus 5. They're saying, this is how God has to be approached when he's offended. You have to come to him with one of the five offerings, a trespass offering. And then they know even more. Look at verse 6. They know aspects of Israel's history. In verse 6, they say, why then, they're saying this to their civil magistrates, why then do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? When he did mighty things among them, did they not let the people go that they might depart? And so you start looking and thinking, these guys know a lot. They know general revelation. They know about the sacrificial system of Israel. They know Israel's history. Why, they're, they're on the road to being orthodox. Then look harder at what they say. Look at what they get wrong. They forget, for example, when they're giving the advice to their civil magistrates, the necessity of slaying a ram as part of their guilt offering. They don't mention that. They also cook up the idea, and this will show you, what a mixed bag most pagans are. Look at verse 4, verse 5, verse 8. They cook up this idea. The diviners just, they just have to get the wackiness in there. And so look at what they say in verse 4, 5, and 8. They cook up this idea of appeasing God with images fashioned of gold, detestable, unclean rats. Now, they obviously hadn't read much of the Old Testament scriptures that, that they had available to them because they would have known that these are among the most unclean, most ceremonially unclean of all animals. But they say to their civil magistrates, yeah, make some golden rats, you know, like the ones that are ravaging our fields right now. And then there's one other thing that they get wrong. The diviners mandate that the ark be trans, transported on a cart as a means for the ark, expressly forbidden. So they're this mix of truth and falsehood. And the diviners tell the Philistine leaders to send the ark back for two reasons. Look at verse 3 carefully. They do get this right. They say, first of all, send it back to remove the deadly object. They say, then you'll be healed if you'll do this. And second, to determine the root cause of their difficulties. You see, these diviners are still trying to figure out, is this is all of our hardship because of Jehovah or not? So they say, it'll be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. So here's their brilliant plan. Look at verses 7 and 8. So they say, okay, get that ark, the one that's causing wreaking havoc all over the nation, put it on a cart, then put a trespass offering on the cart with it, in verse 8. And then here's the part where you're thinking, who thinks this is a good idea? Look at verse 7. Hitch up this cart, holding the, the Ark of the Covenant and trespass offering, to two milk cows that had baby calves. This is kind of like Oklahoma logic here. And then make sure these two milk cows can never have been yoked, put in a harness together to pull the cart. Now, just like 
all the hurdles that Jehovah had to jump through versus the prophets of Baal atop Mount Carmel. There are lots of hurdles here. The reason <coughs> why the Philistine diviners do this is they're <coughs> trying to set up an impossible situation. And so here's their thinking. By saying, put the ark on the back of a cart with a trespass offering, hook it up to a couple of milk cows that just had calves. And if these two calves, who have never been yoked before, can pull several miles together in one direction and make it to Beth Shemesh, Israelite territory, maybe Jehovah's in this. And if they could keep walking away from the barn where their calves are, you know what calves do when they're infants and they see their mother walking away. Hey! And so if, they, if these milk cows can walk away, that's probably of Jehovah. These actions would be proof that these cows were being supernaturally led. So they're setting up a trap. Well, Jehovah's really going to have to come through because two cows that have never been in a yoke before, one's pulling this way, the other's pulling that way, usually they just end up in a mess on the ground. But notice their theology. Look at verse 9. But if the cows don't make it that far to Beth Shemesh, the first Israelite city they could come to, if they turn back, all these calamities have come upon the Philistines, here it comes, by chance. Ah, the Achilles heel of the Philistine theology. The problem, of course, and maybe you came into this room tonight, and maybe that's the term you throw around. Maybe you're that guy who, you know, says... As somebody's walking away, hey, good luck with that job interview this week. And you talk a lot about randomness and chance. You'd make a good Philistine. The problem, of course, is, look at those words in verse 9. There's no such thing as chance. There's not one rogue molecule in the universe. How do I know this? Let me take you on a quick tour and remind you of what the Bible teaches. That there's no such force as chance, that all our lives, every moment of our days is decreed eternally by a sovereign God. In fact, let me just cut to the chase. Look at Ephesians 1, and you can see what the scriptures say very clearly about this. Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians 1, 11, Paul's talking a lot about sovereignty, predestination. And he says in Ephesians 1.11, this actually is the broadest, most expansive statement of God's decree anywhere in the Bible. Ephesians 1.11, Paul writes, In him, that is Christ also, we've obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him, here it comes, who works all things according to the counsel of his will. That's the decree of God. That he works all things <clears throat> according to the counsel of his will. There's no such thing as chance. Now you're thinking, hey Carl, what about, you used to live in Las Vegas. The Las Vegas is full of chance. Nope. Every spin of the roulette wheel, every dice tossed onto the table, all decreed by God. In fact, Proverbs says so in Proverbs 16. It says, the lot is cast into the lap. To put that in a 21st century parlance, we'd say, the dice is thrown onto the table. The writer of Proverbs says in Proverbs 16.33, the lot is cast into the lap, but its every return is of the Lord. God has also ordained what we would say the small stuff. We're told in Matthew chapter 10 by Jesus, the number of hairs on your head, the number of birds who fall from the sky, all ordained by God. Even what you would think, well, certainly this is a free action. It's not ordained. Proverbs 21 tells us the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and the Lord turns it wherever he wills. He controls the heart motives of rulers and paupers. And even your own sanctification right now. You think, I, Carl, I walked a little old lady across the street yesterday. I know that wasn't decreed by God. That was my idea. Listen to what Ephesians 2.10 says. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In fact, even the bad stuff is ordained by God. 
You remember what Joseph said to his brothers in Genesis chapter 50 when they come to apologize to him for the last 25 years of abuse they'd heaped on him, beginning with selling him into slavery. Joseph stops and says, I'm a Calvinist. Well, he doesn't say that, but in so many words he does. He says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And so look at these poor Philistines with their theology. Look at what they're, they're counting on. They're saying in our text, 1 Samuel 6, verse 9. They're saying, you know, if things don't, if God doesn't pass the test, if Jehovah doesn't pass the test, well, I guess the world is random and ordered by chance. Well, you know what happens. The text tells us. Jehovah passes all the conditions. The cows pull together in the yoke like they'd been working with each other their whole life. The cows march straight to Beth Shemesh together like they were just on I-85 together. The cows march right up to a perfect spot for a sacrifice and stop. The citizens of Beth Shemesh, the first city inside Israelite territory, are, are engaged in the busiest time of the year. It's harvest, we're told in verse 13. When they look up from their labors and hear comes the strangest looking cart they've ever seen. First of all, who uses a milk cow to pull a cart? But here come two, and these two are stepping in in rhythm. They're yoked together, and they're working together. And they see these two milk cows walk right up to the biggest, broad, flat rock in the field and stop like they want somebody to service them. Now, Beth Shemesh, as you look in our text, it's a Levitical city set aside for the descendants of Aaron way back in Joshua 21. So meaning this town was full of priests and Levites. Who more would have rejoiced than anyone in Israel at the celebration of the return of the ark? This city full of priests and Levites, descendants of Aaron. And they would have been running around saying, Ichabod is no longer. The glory that's departed is back. The Lord has defeated Dagon. Their worshipers have admitted defeat, and they've paid a ransom. They've sent not only back our ark, but they've sent back gold images, and that gold's worth a lot. In fact, the fact that the ark returns with gold on it remember, reminds us of how Israel plundered the Egyptians when they left. Now the Israelites are plundering the Philistines. Now twice, don't you notice <clears throat> one of the key occurrences of that day? Look at verse 14 and 15. We're told twice on that day that burn offerings were sacrificed. So here are the people of Beth Shemesh, and they immediately say, start up the fires, we need to celebrate, we need to offer burnt offerings to God. Burnt offerings were one of five types of sacrifices the believer could offer. Meal offerings, peace offerings, sin offerings, trespass offerings, burnt offerings, all contained in the first part of Leviticus. And the, uh, when you celebrated a burnt offering, the offer, it was, it was rated according to your income. The offer brought what he could afford. If you were wealthy, you brought an unblemished offering from the herd. If you were middle class, you brought a spotless offering from the flock. And if you were poor, you brought an unblemished pigeon. Only clean animals could be brought. They couldn't bring to God that which he had forbidden them to eat. And the offerer would lay his hand on the the head of that sacrificial animal, confessing his sin, transferring his guilt to the substitute, stating that the sacrificial animal was dying the death he should die. Of course, every single burn offering in the Old Covenant, tens, hundreds of thousands of them, were a picture of Christ, our perfect, unblemished, spotless substitute. But I want you to look carefully at our text. Look at verse 14 and 15. And I want you to notice in verse 14 what these, all of these Levites and priests who live in this town, you think, these guys don't read their Bibles. And their Bibles are only this big. Their canon of Scripture at that point was maybe seven books. Notice what they do in verse 14. They offer the milk cows as a sacrificial offering. Now, this is mildly humorous because... You don't have to get three verses deep into Leviticus. Leviticus 1 verse 3 to find out that only male animals could be sacrificed. I don't know if you know this or not, if you know much about farming and livestock, but milk cows are females. And so notice what these uh, these priests and Levites do. They already are 
acting ignorantly of the old covenant scriptures. But the Lord is pleased to accept their very imperfect obedience as an acknowledgement of their guilt and their need of an atoning substitute. Now, notice who is, who's sort of watching from the hillside. Look at verse 16. The Philistines have followed the milk cart to the very edge of their territory, or the, and they, they watch this cart being drawn by these milk cows, and they're saying, wow, these milk cows, they, they work together in a yoke, in a harness together. They come straight towards Israel. They ignored the, the cries of their baby calves back in the barn. And they, they even kind of broke into a sprint. And so looks like Jehovah's in this. Looks like he's met the test. And so they're watching and they head back to Philistia with a huge sense of relief. And they're saying, oh, good, that ark is out of here. Now I want you to think about something for a moment. Step out of the text for a moment. How easy would it have been for the Philistines while they had the ark in their possession to burn or destroy the ark? They could have. It would have brought God's wrath, but they could have done that. But notice the ark is rescued and back in its rightful hands without the intervention of one single Israelite soldier. Not one soldier has to cross into Philistine territory to rescue the ark. It's all done sovereignly by God without the help of one man. I love rescue mission stories. My favorite is Operation Thunderbolt. Don't know, most of you are way too young to remember this, but I remember it. On June 27, 1976, a, a flight left Tel Aviv, Israel, bound for Paris. And it was hijacked by Muslim terrorists and he was taken to Entebbe, Uganda, where Muslim dictator Idi Amin celebrated. And so here sat this plane full of Israeli citizens, sitting on the runway, being tortured, being abused in Uganda. This is far away. <clears throat> so immediately, as soon as the plane is hijacked, an Israeli commando team is formed. A few days later, they fly by night 2,500 miles from Israel to Entebbe. Their rescue operation was entitled Operation Thunderbolt. They landed at Entebbe Airport. They were there less than an hour and a half. Of the 106 Israeli hostages, 102 were rescued. The only Israelite soldier killed during this rescue operation was Benjamin Netanyahu's older brother, Jonathan. Get the movie. It's fascinating. And so you see these, these ultimate sort of a cross between SEALs and Army Rangers and Green Berets. Israelite special forces drop in and they rescue their citizens and take off into the sky. That's not what happens with the ark. Look who rescues it. Look at the vehicle. It's not commandos. It's a couple of milk cows pulling a cart. Kind of lowly, huh? Well, it'd be nice if the narrative ended at verse 18. Look at your text, and you you think, boy, wouldn't it be great if we could just draw a line right there and the story be done? Not so fast. No sooner is the rejoicing and the sacrificing done when the Lord gives Israel a massive reminder of who they're dealing with. The Lord strikes 50,000 men, we are told in verse 19, of Beth Shemesh. These would be largely Levites and priests. Now remember, the Philistines had just recently killed, seven months earlier, 34,000 Israelites in battle. But God, in his holy chastising wrath, kills more than 50,000 in one day. And why does he do so? Look carefully at verse 19. Because all of these priests and Levites who should have known their Bible, should have known the law of God from Numbers 4, they decide, here's our chance. We never get to do this. The, the Ark of the Covenant's always hidden behind curtains. It's always in the Holy of Holies. We're going to take a peek into the Ark of the Covenant. It was a death penalty offense. They couldn't walk by faith. They just had to see. They had to walk by sight. And so what we see is this astounding carnage. Look at verse 19. Thousands of Israelite men die right next to the mercy seat. That which is intended to be the greatest blessing turns out to be the sharpest curse. And this reminds the Israelites that Jehovah requires obedience and not just sacrifice. God serves notice on his people. 
that there's nothing automatic about his grace. They can't presume on his favor. The return of the ark didn't mean instant blessing for all Israelites, irrespective of their heart, perspective, and their acts of obedience or disobedience. We see an an analogous situation in the church at Corinth, where people were casually approaching the mysteries, the sacraments. And because of that, many were sick and many died, we're told in 1 Corinthians 11. Why did these men do what they did? Look at verse 19. Why did all of these priests and Levites peer into the ark? To do so, to view the ark as merely a curiosity, like it's a piece in a museum, is to ignore the meaning of the ark. The ark was God's throne on earth. It was the point in space and time where the Lord had met with his chosen people and received their worship. Just like the burning bush in the desert, it was designated holy ground because The presence of the Lord was there. The death of tens of thousands of Israelite men at Beth Shemesh testifies to the repeated truth of God's word. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. It's no accident that the Lord took away the Ark of the Covenant, by the way, at the close of the Old Covenant. Otherwise, men would have just placed it in a museum to be gawked at. And so the question is asked after this awful thing, The ark is back, and all the people of Beth Shemesh think, boy, it's clear sailing from now. The day ends with 50,000 residents dead. And so in sheer terror, the men of Beth Shemesh ask the question that you and I should ask. Look at verse 20. Who is able to stand before this holy God? The flaring out of the Lord's wrath produces a moment of clarity and dread on the part of the surviving men of Beth Shemesh. And they collectively cry out these words. And I, I don't know if you've ever done it, but I hope you will tonight. Who is able to stand before this holy God? Well, certainly not you and I. Not Dagon. They see the issue quite clearly. They realize they've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. They're all worthy of the same death just suffered by these ark peakers. Their response, by the way, is to simply do what the Philistines have been doing and send the ark on, look at verse 21, to its next location, just get it out of here. But stop with me for a moment and let's answer the question in verse 20, because this is the question of the ages. It's the question which every man, every woman must answer. Who is able to stand before this holy God? The answer, of course, is only the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ had to be sinless and perfectly holy because if he himself had the guilt and pollution of sin, he could only suffer and die for his own sins and not for the elect. Jesus also had to be God, perfectly God, in order to offer a sacrifice of infinite value to the Father. If the Messiah were a mere man or even a mighty angel, then he wouldn't have been able to atone for the sins of millions of people from every tribe and nation and tongue, but with both a divine and human nature. Christ, who is both God and man, is the only one who meets every biblical condition of a substitute. He alone is the unblemished substitute. He's the only one who could properly mediate between God and man. And so there's an answer to the question. Look at verse 20. Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? Only the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the only safe place to be found is to be found in Him, in union with this Christ. How do we apply this word? I alluded to it a moment ago, the humility of this picture. It's it's almost laughable because you see these two chubby cows walking along, pulling a cart with the Ark of the Covenant on it. The humility is astounding. The sacred ark being pulled around in a $20 wagon drawn by dairy cattle. But this is just a down payment. A foreshadowing of that day when God the Son comes and takes lowly flesh. And no day was lowlier than the day when he rode into town. Not on a white charger, but on the back of a donkey. And so as you see this parade, 
It should point you immediately towards the lowliness and humility of Christ. Just as the ark was a foreshadowing of that day, the reality was when Jesus humbly entered in triumph Jerusalem. But I want you to notice one other truth. There's a, there's a profound truth being taught in this conversation that happens. I told you this is the longest Philistine conversation recorded in the Bible. Look back to verse 5 where we have this discussion happening between the civil magistrates of the Philistines and the religious, the diviners. And in verse 5, notice what the diviners say. Remember we told you they actually know quite a bit, as does every lost man. In verse 5 they say, Therefore you shall make images of your tumors and images of your rats that ravage the land, and you shall give glory to the God of Israel. Do you hear what these pagans are saying? They're saying, we need to give glory to Jehovah. What Israel had bemoaned, the glory had departed. Remember Ichabod? The Philistines want to be sure to do. You make sure to give God glory. Do you see emerging now out of the dimness of the old covenant what Jehovah is up to? What we see Jehovah doing is he's not just getting glory from Israelites. He's getting glory from all the nations. These are Gentiles who are saying, be sure to work this plan so that Jehovah gets glory. And this should be a lesson for Israel. Jehovah is not just for them. In fact, the day will soon come as the full light of the new covenant shines when the Lord will revel in bringing near those who were far off by the blood of Jesus. What we see is this is God's intention for every nation to give glory to him. Let's pray together. Our Father, we see ourselves in this text we see just like the men who had to peer into the ark that we too are marked by irreverence. We have been like the men of Beth Shemeth. And just like the Philistines who want to talk about chance and luck, we sound like diviners. Lord, have mercy. By this word, acquaint us with the fear of the Lord. By this word, remind us of your sovereign control over all things. By this word, remind us of the necessity of approaching you with reverence. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's respond to the word by taking our Trinity Psalter hymnal. Turn to hymn 173 as we stand for our closing hymn. Hymn 173, Almighty God, your word is cast. Ladies, let me encourage you to stop by the booth in the narthex to sign up for the events happening this week. Now receive the Lord's blessing, his word of grace to his beloved church. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.